Okay. Um, this is Scott Howard. Um, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the April 2nd, 2020 meeting of the Riverfront Design Committee. This is the City of Oklahoma City's first teleconferenced RDC meeting. My name is Scott Howard and I'm the chair of the committee. There are a few announcements to make regarding the teleconference meeting. Um, if the teleconference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the audio connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 30 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued to the next regularly scheduled Riverfront Design Committee meeting on Thursday, May 7, 2020 at 9 a.m. by teleconference. The agenda and documents are located on OKC.gov. Please remember that only one person can be heard at a time. If more than one person speaks, we won't hear both, both of you. For anyone speaking today, including committee members, please identify yourself when you begin to speak. There will be a roll call every 15 minutes, and all votes will be by roll call. Anyone wishing to speak about an agenda item has hopefully already contacted staff so that your name is on the list to be called on at the appropriate time. In case there are people wishing to speak that have not contacted staff, I will allow time for that during discussion for each item by announcing that additional speakers need to unmute their phones by pressing star six. State their name and they have three minutes to speak. When you call in, Staff will be muting your phone. You will be able to hear the, the meeting. Please keep your phones on mute until you are recognized to speak. To unmute your phone, again, press star six. And I'd also like to welcome, we have two new members to the committee today. Uh, welcome Gloria Torres and welcome back Brian Doherty. Uh, Mark, would you please uh, conduct the roll call, please? Yes, sir. Scott Howard. Here. John Postick. Present. Michelle Dean. Here. Brian Doherty. Brian Doherty. Jonathan Heisel. Here. John Joyce. Here. Barbara Larson. Here. Dana Templeton. Present. Gloria Torres. Present. I'm going to go back and ask if Brian Doherty is here. This is Laura. Brian, can you star six? Maybe you're muted by accident. Yeah, no, he's here. This is Brian. Okay, you're here. Okay. Got it. Great. Okay. So we have, uh, sounds, looks like we have a quorum. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, item two, approval of minutes uh, from March 5th, 2020. This is John Posick. I motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Okay. Do we have a second? Barbara Larson, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, Mark, would you please do a roll call vote? Scott Howard. Yes. John Postick? Yes. Michelle Dean? Yes. Brian Doherty? I'm going to abstain. I was not there, but I have listened to the. I did list, go back and listen to it, but I was not present. Do you want me to list you as a um, abstain? Yeah, I think abstain. I just wanted to make sure that when other discussion comes up, I have gone and listened to the entire meeting from before. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Heisel? Yes. Jo John Joyce? Yes. Barbara Larson? Yes. Dana Templeton? Yes. Gloria Torres? Stain, please. So we have eight eyes and one abstention. No, there's. This is Laura. There are seven eyes and two abstentions. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. 
So who who did the abstention? Gloria? Yes. And Brian. And Brian. Correct. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, item three, cases withdrawn, none. Item four, continuance request, none. Item five, consent docket, none. Item six, cases for individual consideration. And 6A is SRCA-20-0002 at 1342 Southwest 3rd Street. Laura, would you like to present the, the case? Thank you. This is Laura Griggs, Planning Department. This is a request to install a six-foot tall electrified security fence inside the existing chain link fence. A variance is required from the fence material regulation. This is similar to a previous item you guys had a year or so back, uh, which was just down the street. Uh, and the issue here is this is a building material supply yard, and due to the problem they're having with theft, they are, um, they've tried all options, and they're wanting to... They're wanting to um, uh, keep their uh, sorry keep the yard more secure. Um, this is located in an industrial park, as you can see from the pictures that we included in the packet, which are available on the city's website. Also included in the packet was a picture of a similar fence uh, that is actually located um, off of South Walker. Um, and that one was also installed with a six-foot chain link fence, and behind that is the 10-foot electric fence that they want to uh, install. As referenced in the staff report, um, it is uh, probable and highly likely that the wire just kind of disappears because the wire is so thin, which is what these pictures show you. Um, Staff is recommending approval, subject to uh, a condition that the applicant obtain a variance from the Board of Adjustment from the fence material regulation. And you will need to make two motions, um, like we always have to do when an item has to go to the Board of Adjustment, if you determine that you're recommending approval. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? So this is Gloria. I have a question. I and you, I've looked at this and it says that there, um, that it is an industrial area. Is there any reason that school children or children would be uh, crossing through here and would run the risk of inadvertently? Uh, this is Laura again. The, the electric fence is being installed behind the chain link fence. Um, the chain link fence runs along the property line. So the only way to get to the electric fence is if you would climb over the six foot fence that has barbed wire on the top Okay. to get into it. So I'm not saying uh, some kids can't climb very well. I, I, don't I don't perceive that to be an issue. There are no residences in the area. Um, and there isn't any sidewalks in this area at all either. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, is there an applicant um, that would like to speak? Is Michael Pate is the applicant? If you can unmute your phone, this is Laura. Hey, Laura, can you hear me? Yes, we can. If you can identify okay. yourself, please. <clears throat> yes. Uh, this is Michael Pate. I'm with Amarok Perimeter Security Systems in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, uh, Gloria, I don't know your last name, so I'm just going to say Gloria. Gloria, uh, Laura is correct. Um, we actually um, install behind the existing chain link fence. The probability of anyone touching it by accident are almost zero. Um, someone actually has to uh, uh, be committing criminal trespass to actually touch the electric security fence. It's powered by a 12-volt battery, so it's never connected to the mains, and it pulses. 
So it's a very safe and reliable device. Um, Laura, I'm not sure how many we have uh, installed here, but it's got to be in the 20s or 30s. <clears throat> um, also, uh, I basically just want to say thank you, Laura, for, um, for all you've done here. Um, uh, and we would appreciate a positive vote so we can move forward with the installation. And if anyone has any questions at all, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, Mike. Um, are there any um, citizens that would like to comment? If not, I uh, would ask uh, committee, committee members if they have any questions. This is Barbara Larson. Um, I wanted to just confirm that one location for the knock box has been coordinated with the fire department. Um, this is Michael Pate again, and the answer to that is yes. Each fire department has its own special knock switch, so we actually have to go to the fire department to order the knock switch so they know where it is and um, uh, we install it according to the plan and their approval of the plan. This is Barbara again. Can you um, identify where the con electronic controller is located on this site? Uh, Barbara, I do not have the plans in front of me. Okay. But the control box, the electronic control box is on the solar array. So there's a solar array, and underneath that array is where the electronic control panels are. So you have the energizer in there, which basically takes the 12 volts and amplifies it. You've got the alarm panel in there, and you've got the battery box. So all that is contained in the same place. It's always behind the fence. Uh, we usually locate it in the most exposed area we can possibly find, meaning that we have to have sunlight hitting those panels. If you just have 10% of a panel that's shaded, it takes out 80% of the, of the efficacy of that panel. So it really won't operate at full speed unless it's out in the sunshine. So we actually put it on the site plan. Laura will probably be able to point it out if she has the site plan in front of her. But sometimes or occasionally you might move it a little bit just to make sure we get proper sunlight on the solar panels. Sorry, this is Laura because I was looking on the site plan it's not there to see where it's at i see where the knox box location is but i'm not seeing where the solar array is proposed to be located it is it not on c3 um on to the right there's a, a diagram showing three components front rear and side i believe the solar array I, appears to be at the top I, I do see those. I'm just trying, this is Laura again, I'm just trying to figure out where they're located on that site plan, which oh, is okay. on sheet C1. Usually, Laura, it will be just, this is Michael Pate again, it will be just inside the front gate, usually, right by the Knox box. Okay, so if it's right by the, the Knox box, then that's located toward the western end of the street frontage that they have. That's shown with that red circle on sheet three, C1. Okay. Are there any other questions for Michael? And just for point of reference, and I have to apologize, the, the pictures that staff took that are included in the packet ended up coming off on big paper. But if you were to look at the pictures, um, there is a picture which states, looking west down Southwest 3rd Street, subject site is on the left. And if you look at that picture, the Knox box is, you can see the western edge of the entrance drive. And so the Knox box is going to be located on the western edge of that entrance. And so then the solar array will be located near that area. <coughs> if everyone can see that picture. Okay. This is the chair. Thank you, Laura. Um, so basically, I think, we, as Laura mentioned, we'll have two votes. Um, 
one for the application and then one for the Board of Adjustment. Um, chair would entertain a motion. This is, this is Tom Hi. Joy. Go ahead. Go ahead, Barbara. Barbara. This is Barbara Larson. I make a motion that we approve this um, proposal. Okay. Um, this is this is Laura Griggs. Can I request that you um, look at the staff report to include all that wording, please, in your motion? All righty. I have too many papers. John, go ahead and take it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Laura, am I look, I'm looking under under E staff recommendation. Yeah, Laura, okay. Yeah, okay. Forward. This is Barbara. I found it. I found it. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the application on the basis that the project complies with the regulations and guidelines of the Scenic River Overlay District Design District Zoning Ordinances as referenced in Section C and D of the staff report with the condition that the applicant obtain a variance from the Board of Adjustment from the fence material regulations. Okay, this is the chair. Do we have a second? This is John Joyce. I second. Thank you, John. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, this is John Postick. Um, I, I'd like to pose a question to Laura, um, Laura Griggs, and also the um, uh, our, our legal staff. Um, am I permitted to? add an amendment to that motion to add our number two of uh, we would further like to provide a recommendation of approval to the Board of Adjustment for a variance to defense material regulations, or should that be a separate motion done after this vote? This is Laura McDevitt. Yeah, that would be appropriate for a second motion. Okay, then I, I withdraw my comment. Okay, this is the chair. Uh, Mark, would you please proceed with the roll call vote? Yes, sir. Scott Howard. Yes. John Postick. Yes. Michelle Dean. Yes. Brian Doherty. Yes. Jonathan Heisel. Yes. John Joyce. Yes. Barbara Larson. Yes. Dana Templeton. Yes. Gloria Torres. Yes. Nine yeses and no nays. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the motion uh, passes. Uh, thank you, Michael, for um, uh, calling in on the call today. Uh, let's um, move to the second part of this approval. Uh, Chair would entertain a motion. This is John Postick. I'd like to provide a. I'd like to make a motion to provide a recommendation of approval to the Board of Adjustment for a variance to the fence material regulations. Thank you, John. Do we have a second? This is Barbara. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Mark, would you please do a roll call vote? Okay. I showed that Postick moved. Larson seconded. Uh, Scott Howard. Yes. John Postick? Yes. Michelle Dean? Yes. Brian Doherty? Yes. Jonathan Heisel? Yes. John Joyce? Yes. Barbara Larson? Yes. Dana Templeton? Yes. Gloria Torres? Yes. And I'm recording nine ayes and no nays. Okay. Thank you. Part two was approved. We'll go to item uh, 6B, case SRCA-20-0003 at 3300 West Reno Avenue. 
Laura, would you like to present? Thank you, Chair. This is Laura Griggs, Planning Department. <clears throat> this is also a request to install a 10-foot tall electrified security fence inside the existing chain link fence. This site is located on the south side of West Reno, north of I-40, I-44. It is immediately south of the fairgrounds. Maxwell Supply is a, a construction supply company. They've been at that location for uh, several decades. Due to an issue they're having with security and theft, this proposal is to add, as I said, that an electrified fence that will be located inside or behind the existing chain link fence, um, similar to the last location. This is an industrially zoned piece of property surrounded by industrial property. Um, the committee, um, let me back up on that one, sorry. Uh, since this item needs a variance, it had to go to the committee and you'll also be having the two motions like you did on the last one. Um, we included the same pictures in your packet of the existing fence that's out down off South Walker to show the visibility of the proposed fence is minimal and um, staff feels that being that it's an industrial area uh, that we would recommend approval subject to um, the applicant obtaining a variance from the Board of Adjustment from Fence Material Regulations. And I might add that um, both the last item and this item are on the agenda for this afternoon's teleconference Board of Adjustment meeting. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Um, is there an applicant that would like to speak or the owner that would like to speak? We have Michael Pate is the applicant. Good morning. This there we is go. Charlie Thomason with Maxwell Supply Company. Good morning. Charlie. I would. Good morning. Um, I'd just like to say uh, we've we've tried to work with our neighbors. Uh, spoke with uh, Gary Thompson, Vice President of Corporate Real Estate from BOK, which is our next door neighbor to the east. His uh, his comment was great idea. Thank you for fortifying our west fence. Um, if we do this. Uh, so I've tried to talk with the neighbors, and they're on board. Uh, one of our neighbors down the street at the corner of May Avenue is uh, Northwest Crane, and they have this exact fence up running in their property. Um, and the other thing, we've had this very fence inside our Tulsa property, which is a five-acre uh, property, similar construction supplies, in North Tulsa for almost a year and a half. And we have had no crime, and we really like it. So uh, I'd really appreciate if you saw it in your view to approve this. Uh, we think it's a great crime deterrent. And like I heard on the last request, we're in a industrial neighborhood with no sidewalks or schools. So uh, I'd, I hope that this uh, is approved. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. This is the chair. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Certainly. Are there any citizens that would like to comment or speak? Um, Mr. Chair, this is Michael Pate again with Electric Guard Dog. Um, just um, would like to echo Charlie's comments, uh, ask for the approval of the board, and if you have any questions at all about the operation of the Amarok electric security fence, I would be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, are there any committee members that have questions? This is Barbara. I have a quick question. It looks uh, like on this photo, um, photo number three, existing fence, that the fence is um, painted or has a vinyl coating on it. Is that true? Uh, Michael, there were, this is Laura Griggs. They're referring to a picture that I took. Um, so it is. it was in the packet. It's, I believe the fence that's out there is a black coated chain link fence. Um, Laura, so I'd like I to add, Charlie. Am I still unmuted? This is Charlie Thomason. We can hear you, Charlie. This is Laura. Yes. Yes. Our our existing fence is the six foot. It's the black vinyl coated and black post. Um, 
I don't recall how many years. It's probably been 10 years that we put it up. But, yes, it is the vinyl code. This is Barbara again. So so is the proposed um, electrified fence going to be vinyl coated as well, or are you just putting uh, uncoated up? Uh, this is Michael Pate with uh, Amarok. Uh, the electric security fence will not be vinyl coated. If it is, it won't work. <laughs> it has to be a bare well, wire. Um, so it it will be a bare wire. Um, we can we can actually uh, paint the posts or get the get the color of the posts themselves to match the black vinyl. But the actual wires themselves, we cannot do that. This is Barbara again. Yes, I just needed clarification because it's a different condition than what we looked at before and may not appear as translucent as if they were both exactly colored, both scented. Colored the and, and Barbara, Barbara, this is Michael Pate. Yeah, the contrast in the wire, the, the, the wire we use is actually gray, so the black, your eye would go almost straight to the black. You would never see the, the wire behind it just because there's really no contrast there at all between the two colors. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. This is the chair. Are there any other questions from the committee? Okay. Uh, chair would entertain a motion. This is John Joyce. I would move approval of the application on the basis that the project complies with the regulations and guidelines of the Scenic River Overlay Design District Zoning Ordinance as referenced in Section C and D of the staff report with the condition that the applicant obtain a variance from the Board of Adjustment from the fence material regulations. Okay, thank you, John. Do we have a second? This is Barbara, a second. Thank you, Barbara. <coughs> is there any further discussion? Mark, would you please do a roll call vote? Yes, I'm showing that uh, Joyce Moved, seconded by Larson. Correct. Uh, Scott Howard. Yes. John Postick. Yes. Michael, Mich no, I'm sorry, Michelle Dean. Yes. Brian Doherty. Yes. Jonathan Heisel. Yes. John Joyce. Yes. Barbara Larson. Yes. Dana Templeton. Yes. Gloria Torres. Yes. Okay. Nine eyes, no nays. Okay, thank you. The motion passes. Uh, now for the part two. Uh, Chair would entertain a motion. This is John Postick. I'd like to make a motion to provide a recommendation of approval to the Board of Adjustment for a variance to the fence material regulations. Thank you, John. Do we have a second? Dana Templeton will second. Thank you, Dana. Any further discussion? Mark, would you please do a roll call vote? Yes, sir. I'm showing that Postic moves, seconded by Templeton. Correct. Scott Howard. Yes. John Postic. Yes. Michelle Dean. Yes. Brian Doherty. Yes. Jonathan Heisel. Yes. John Joyce. Yes. Barbara Larson. Yes. Dana Templeton. Yes. Gloria Torres. Yes. I'm sorry, did you say yes? Yes. Okay. I showed that it's uh, nine eyes, zero nays. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, the second motion passes. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, uh, Charles, or Charlie. Thank you very much. You bet. Okay. Um, item 7, other business, 7A, is PUD 01725. I believe this is a continuance.
from a previous meeting? Laura? Uh, Laura Griggs, Planning Department. This item was continued from your last meeting. This is a request to rezone the Boathouse District to a plan unit development, and you would be providing a recommendation to the Planning Commission. This item is scheduled to go to the Planning Commission for their teleconference meeting next Thursday. In your packet uh, on page two under other, I summarized the changes that were made um, uh, and the committee requested additional specifics concerning the proposed large sign locations. And the applicant provided an additional exhibit which is found in the back of that item. It's in front of the pictures. Once again, those pictures are the staff's PowerPoint. They did not come from the applicant. But their second 11 by 17 sheet, which is on the back side, you will see that they showed two potential locations for the large signs, which was discussed at the last meeting. The revisions that they're proposing to their PUD document, as I referenced in the staff report, can be found on page 7 and 8 of the PUD document. And you will see what they're proposing, to, what they deleted is to strike through and what they're adding is, it was underlined and in red. Obviously this is, was in black and white, um, so you couldn't see that. So the only changes that they're proposing since the last time are to the sign regulations. Um, one item that they're proposing to change is on the larger signs. So they're actually proposing to have, uh, instead of freestanding accessory signs, they're proposing to entitle 9.10.1, which is found on page 7 of the PUD document, as large-scale accessory signs. And so they have made changes in there to square footages. Um, there's a reference in there that talks about reviewing or not being reviewed by the committee. The other thing that they did change um, is over on page 8 under temporary signage 9.10.6 where they added a last sentence in that one. So the applicants, uh, both Tim Don Johnson and Mark Zitzow from um, – are on the phone as well as the Lisi, uh Mike Knopp have called in for this. Okay, this is the chair. Um, are, would the applicants like to speak? Yeah, this is Tim Johnson on behalf of the applicant, um, and Mike is uh, called in earlier um, if there's any questions. So we listened to what you all were concerned about at the last meeting and came back and, and worked over the PUD to, to decide that the real intent of this is we want to be able to attach these LED signs to structures that are located in the park facility uh, currently and in the future. And so utilizing the information that Mike has on the uh, new zip line project, uh, we got square footages of the face and sides of those structures and that's where we came up with kind of a it may not be exact so we put it we get made it a kind of a round number of 2500 square feet to not exceed and that we would come back to the committee to review these signs before they would be installed and I felt like that gave you guys the comfort uh, of seeing what they're going to look like before they get built uh, and I felt that's what we we took away from the meeting that was your Okay. Thank you, Tim. Are there questions from the committee? Uh, this is John Joyce. I I don't really have a question, uh, but I would say that Tim read my mind pretty well on that. Uh, that was what I was concerned. So if they're if they're willing to come back and kind of show us what the signs are going to look like at the time they put them up, then that would alleviate my concern. Thank you, John. Any other this questions? Is, uh, Barbara. This is Barbara Larson. Um, I have a question um, about 9.10.1. Um, 
I basically need a clarification. The 2,500 total square foot of signage, it is not clear to me whether that is um, pertaining only to the large signs on these two structures or if it includes all the signs because the second, third, fourth, and fifth paragraph of 9.10.1 appear to be part of the same paragraph, the same article. So when I read through this, I almost get the impression that the 2,500 square feet of signage would apply to the large-scale accessory, to the freestanding signs because it says undetermined amount, um, the ground-mounted directional signs as well as the flagpole signs. And so I, I'd like clarification on that. Uh, this is Tim Johnson. Uh, the 2,500 square feet is intended to apply to the large-scale accessory signs only, uh, and that's why it's in that uh, paragraph, engulfed in that paragraph. And the first sentence uh, of that second paragraph, attached large-scale accessory signs shall be permitted within this PUD and limited to the 2,500 square feet. Then it goes on to describe uh, how the signs can be used. The next paragraph then talks about the freestanding signs. And so the, we felt like that's clear that that's dealing with the large scale signs in that paragraph. The next paragraph deals with uh, the freestanding signs. Um, we can further clarify that by putting a subsection if necessary before the PUD goes to Planning Commission. Okay, so so um, all of the other signs are not limited to the um, number or square footage that will be installed in the area. Tim Johnson again. Yeah, that's correct because the smaller scale signs are thought to be uh, whether they're directional or identifying signs for the events that are going on there at that level and lower, uh, it would be non-obtrusive to anything around the river. Okay. Um, this is Barbara again. And so, uh, so reading the last sentence of that paragraph that says that these um, large-scale accessory signs, in addition to being attached to these two elements shown on your um, diagram that you attached can be attached to other building structures and architectural elements. Is that so in addition to the finish line tower and the zip line tower, um, if we approve this, it would be acceptable to attach these signs on buildings as well. That's the way it's written, yes. Tim Johnson. with the tapping it at 2,500 square feet total. Um, and these, these signs are not temporary. So if we put a sign on the finish line tower and the zip line tower and they total 2,500 square feet, that would be the limit of these large scale accessory signs. Yeah, Tim Johnson again, that's correct. And remember, we're bringing any of these signs back to you. So you'll see where they are and how high they are and their size. Right. Um, this is Barbara. So my, my main concern is that we've pinpointed the um, maximum for these large scale signs. Um, but, but let's say there's an event there and we have that maxed out. And then it says we have an undetermined number of freestanding signs less than 15 feet in height. Then we have an unlimited number of flagpoles with no height restrictions that also have signs on them. Um, and I'm getting a little concerned that by giving carte blanche on 
an undetermined number of all these other signs that it's going to look like sign city. <laughs> oh, Tim Johnson again. So the intent of the, uh, like the flagpole signs and the uh, temporary signages uh, during an event down there, uh, there are vendors and uh, in the future there may be uh, a housing component uh, that want to be able to, during events, advertise uh, the activity that's going on in that portion of the area. And so that's why the, the uh, looseness, for better, lack of better words, is included in here. So that, because what we were, uh, what the Boathouse District has been dealing with over the years is we have an event, uh, Mike doesn't have time to get the event put together and <clears throat> appear before the board to get approval. So oftentimes there were some banner signs that were installed that weren't technically legal because there was not that time to get there. That's what this, the whole purpose of this PUD was to allow that flexibility uh, for uh, to do a better job getting the events in and getting them properly advertised. Tim, this is the chair. I've, I just have a question. So these banner signs are typically, as you said, for an event. So they're they're probably mounted like with what on T post or something, and then after the event, are they removed fairly quickly or? Uh, it, and I, Mike, you can chime in here, but that's the way I envisioned it when we drafted this was oftentimes you see an open house in a new neighborhood and the flag signs are out in front of the house saying open house. Yeah, th this is Mike here, uh, Mike Knopf uh, with the River Sport Foundation. We do, of course, we do a number of events and they all come with different um, requirements with regard to you know, depending on what kind of uh, entity we're working with. For example, we were going to host the Olympic trials in May, but obviously that was postponed. Um, and with that, the U.S. Olympic Committee comes with a whole sign package. So if you ever watch, you know, if you, well, if you watch any professional sports event, like, you know, the Thunder, you can see the way that they present signage at the events. Now, our case, in our case, it's sort of an outdoor arena that constantly changes depending on what kind of event we have. In the case of the Olympic trials, it would be a series of, you know, Olympic trial related branding, which is obviously very good for Oklahoma City because because they want to make sure that is appearing in all the media and television, whatever, um, it, you know, it, within the field of play. And so it's really important to us that we be able to do that, and it and because of this the nature of the venue being built as a international sports venue, we have to be able to have that flexibility. Um, we were going to have an international event in August that would be te televised to 8 million people around the world. And with that, we would have had signage up and down the riverbank that would be branding Oklahoma and our partners. And so that's what this is intended for, that we would be able to you know, put the proper signage up to dress the venue up for these important events. And then, of course, after the events, that signage does come down. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Are there any other questions from the committee? I have questions. This Go is ahead. Dana Templeton. Um, I was uh, rereading everything based on the um, the continuance from last the last meeting. It, one of the reasons given for the continuance was because our packets arrived a little bit late, and we felt we didn't have enough time to review this um, properly. And so, in re taking another look at everything, but including the uh, signage issue, um, I found another one that I'd like to ask some questions about about the um, development regulations under the staff report D1. So. Um, where it talks about this proposal does not comply with the development regulations of the scenic overlay design district zoning ordinance. And basically what this PUD is um, proposing, and it's on page nine of the PUD under 9.17.2, it states development within this PUD shall not be required to go before the Riverfront Design Review, the Design Committee for approvals unless 
greater than a 35,000 square foot floor plate. That's rather large, and it and, I, and it has moved what um, used to be, was it a 10,000 square foot um, threshold that would require it to come before the committee, moving it from a 10 to a 35,000. And um, I have a little heartburn with that. I was, um, I got online this morning and looked at buildings on Google Maps, and the 35,000 square foot floor plate is close to the size of the Republic parking garage, which is north of John Rex School. It's, it's a pretty large floor plate, not including the, I think it was up to six floors or levels, which would be a total of like 210,000 square feet. So I think it's the 35,000 square foot floor plate that's given me heartburn. So anything, they could do 34,000 square foot and not have to come before us to get our approval on a building that large. It could be anything, really. So um, I was expressing concerns about that large number. Dana, this is Barbara. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. like to also mention that um, downtown is 20,000, and I, that also concerns me that the request is for more than what's required in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. I would. Uh, I wonder if we could get consideration for twenty thousand, limiting it to the exact same floor plate as downtown, and leaving within a hundred feet from the top of the bank of the river at ten thousand. Yeah. And I'm going to add to that just for reference. The UCO boathouse is about 14,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. This is the chair. Is um, uh, Tim? Is that something that that the applicant would be willing to consider? Um, yes. Um, can you repeat the last part of that uh, where you made reference? I thought to the height. Um, I thought I'd read somewhere we're currently, go ahead, Laura. We were talking about the square footage of the foot plate yeah, being I'm at 35,000. And so you'd like us to consider going to 20? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then there's also a clause in there that says within 100 feet from the top of the bank of the river, um, you're going to increase the review uh, square footage from 10 to 15, and I'd like to pull that back down to 10. 10,000. So, so our, what we're recommending is the, the committee would review structures over 20,000 square feet or over 10,000 square feet if the structure was within 100 feet of the top of the bank of the river. The uh, indication would be, still be floor plate, correct? What? Yes, I think that's correct. how you are. Yeah. That's how you've got it shown. My, uh, there's a table that is put out in the packet, and uh, I may be reading it incorrectly, but it's table 13500.6. It's a regatta district standard, and there is a minimum and a maximum height on items being much as commercial. So there was, so it could be a, it looks like it could be a 35,000 square foot floor plate with no height limitation that wouldn't have to come before us. Am I reading that right, Laura? Uh, this is Laura Griggs, Planning Department. Yes, that's how I read that. Um, there is something somewhere in here, correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, that talks about six stories. Yeah. I thought I saw that as well. Tim, up to six stories. Yes. Um, so maybe um, <clears throat> some clarification maybe on if something were smaller floor plate, 
if I'm reading this correctly, let's let's just base it on what you're proposing now with 35,000. If it came in at a um, less than 35,000 square foot floor plate, and it was four stories tall, the way you currently have it worded, would it be required to go to the committee? I don't think so. Right. That's am correct. I am I correct with that, Tim? Yes. Okay. So, um, hearing the request from uh, the the two committee members that were talking about reducing the floor plate potentially down to twenty thousand square feet, um, it still would not go back to them if it came in less than that if it was a four-story building, correct? Because you still have... Okay, there it is. Okay, so it's under 9.13 height regulations. Any building or structure constructed six stories or less shall be reviewed administratively by staff. So for a building to go to the committee if they were requesting that you reduce that to 20,000 square feet. If the floor plate is 20,000 square feet or more, it would go to the committee. If the floor plate were only 15,000 square feet, it would only go to the committee if the structure was more than six stories, right? That is correct. Um, and so, since I'm, Mike and I are not in the same room, uh, I would defer to Mike. Uh, I think we can live with that, uh, those two changes, 20 and 10. 20 and 10. Uh, okay, so this is Laura, the Planning Department. Just to, for point of clarification, what you're talking about would be taking 9.17.2. There are two references in that to 20,000 square, for, excuse me, to 35,000 square feet. We're talking about changing the both of those to 20,000 square feet. So it would say, um, would not shall not be required to go before the Riverfront Design Committee for approvals unless greater than a 20,000 square foot floor plate. All signage structures, buildings, or building additions less than 20,000 square feet and any parking lots are permitted for administrative review. The next uh, paragraph down, however, any structure or building over a 10,000 square foot area within 100 foot from the top of the bank of the river shall be heard by the committee. And I'm just, I am was wanting some confirmation that that is what we're currently discussing at the moment. This is Tim Johnson. That's my understanding of the request. This is Diane, okay. I agree. This is Barbara, yes. Okay. This is the chair. Uh, so do we, would we like to make a motion? This uh, is Dana. Would this motion contain two parts or one, I mean, it would be two parts or one part, or we just read all 9.17.2. 9. Um, this is Laura, and I'll reach out to our legal representation, Laura McDivitt. Um, I would think that the motion, if in fact your motion is supportive of the changes we were making, um, would be a, a, have a condition of revision too, and you'd reference that section, and you could specifically reference changing the numbers from 35,000 to 20,000, and then in the next paragraph down, changing 15,000 down to 10,000. Would would you agree with that, Laura? Yes. This is the chair, so it'd still be one, one motion then? Yeah, it, it could all be done in one motion since this is just a recommendation to the Planning Commission and there isn't a, a second component to it, but it would incorporate all of the committee's suggested changes into the motion. Okay. Thank you, Laura. 
This is Brian Doherty. I just have one point of clarification. When you were talking about the height, so we go ahead and leave the height that up to six stories, no matter as long as it's under the twenty thousand, they can go up to six stories. And is that is that similar to what it is in downtown, or since we're trying to align some of this with downtown? I'm, 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 I'm sorry. This is. This is Laura, and I'm not sure what else was going on, so maybe you need to repeat that because there was other discussion in the background. Okay, this is Brian Doherty, and my question was on the, are we leaving the six stories up to six stories alone, or are we also considering that if we're trying to make it in somewhat alignment with what is done in downtown design review? Um, this is Laura Griggs again, and just a point of reference to how it's done in downtown. Uh, any building over 20,000 square feet, and that can be a one-story building or that can be a two- or three-story building, that is not based on floor plate. So this wording that they're proposing is different than what's in downtown. For example, if I had a three-story building and each floor was 10,000 square feet in downtown, that would have to go because the cumulative total is more than 20,000 square feet. So you're saying there's no caveat in there for saying over two stories or three stories. It's just a flat 20,000 square feet? That that is correct on as far as square footage requirements going to the committee. So Dana, this is Barbara. So they could have a twenty thousand square foot floor plate up to six stories. So twenty yes. twenty thousand would only be the first floor. Mm -hmm. And it would be multiplied. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is Dana again. I, I mean, as, speaking as an architect, that would be a pencil, but um, I still would. Um, something to maybe to lower that would would give me less heartburn. So this is Laura Griggs. Um, just for clarification, we're now discussing the 9.13 height. That is where the proposal is any building or structure constructed six stories or less shall be reviewed administratively. So this is Dana again, and I still think that something like this should fall in line with the downtown. It is a high priority, high visibility area. Um, we don't want to cripple them or hobble anybody, but we would like to make sure that it does stick with the branding of Oklahoma City Riverfront Design Review Board and stuff. So Dana, it basically says that if they do something six stories or more, um, it needs to be administratively approved rather than come before the committee. So I, I think that, this is Dana, is that backwards? I think it's backwards, six stories or less. Yeah. Yeah, this is yeah. Tim Johnson. So everything we do has to be done and submitted through the staff for their review. And uh, obviously, over the course of the development of the riverfront uh, and the boathouse district, uh, Mike and his architectural review committee uh, has gone to great detail to make sure mm -hmm. things look a certain way down there in the style, materials, and obviously that would continue. Um, I think the uh, the issues that we're facing are more time constraints that are driven by the uh, requirements of the committee review, and we, we want to adhere to the continued uh, style and architecture of the area and just want to have the ability to work with the staff. And then if something big comes around like these signs, we're back in front of the committee. This is, this is Barbara again. Um, when you're talking about the architectural style, um, I'd like to point out that 9.17, 
reads differently than 9.1. Um, so, so if we're trying to keep with the same architectural style, and then in 9.1, you um, also present other, ma other materials such as brick, rock, stone, concrete board, and then added modified shipping containers. Um, I think there's a little bit of a, a disconnect there uh, as to what you're going for. And without a master plan of the area, it's hard for us as a committee to just approve everything. So the intent of the different languages, obviously, if we did a six-story building, it would be a lot more glass and steel. You wouldn't want six stories of white metal. Um, so I think they're two different issues. Uh, and they do, Mike has a very strict design guideline that him and his board deal with. And so. yeah, this, this is Mike here. I, Mike Knopp, I'm happy to jump in for a second. Um, obviously, I think I would hope everyone would agree that for the past 15 years, we have in some ways really set the standard for design for, for the river in terms of the, you know, the, what this has brought international attention to Oklahoma City and has really become a differentiator. We have in no way any desire to change our focus on maintaining that level of quality. I would suggest, however, that there are we want to be flexible because there there have there you know right now we are really impeded by you know many different challenges one being the fact that we don't have enough signage you know we have no way of explaining you know getting you know properly uh, directing people to the venue which is what we're dealing with here but also we have to be able to attract you know additional development here for this to become a long-term sustainable venue and it has to be attractive to potential partners and developers knowing that we are going to maintain a high standard that we always have in 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 the uh in the design are they all going to be white triangular polycarbonate buildings no but can they will they fit in in a in a way that we're all going to be proud absolutely um and i would also suggest that there's different parts of the venue for example the area north of the whitewater center which is not along the riverfront um is something with you know we we see potentially taking on a little bit of a different character with the upcoming barquet dog park and kind of more of the uh the, the wooded nature area and being able to do some things in there so um so we are absolutely going to maintain high standards, and as we always have, and I think we've we've spent over, you know nearly 100 million dollars doing that. So I would like to underscore to this committee that I, I hope you have a degree of trust in what we're doing and what we're going to continue to do for the future. This is Laura from the Planning Department, and just for clarification, when you look at their exhibit and they show the limits of this. PUD, and just as a reminder of what those holes in the PUD are for, those holes in the PUD were, were property that were acquired by condemnation, and so they're not included in this PUD. Those properties will still be governed by both the downtown design district regulations because of the zoning DTD2 and the Scenic River design guidelines because it's an overlay. So the current requirements of both of those will still apply to all of those areas that are cut out and aren't shown in blue shade. So I just wanted to remind everybody that. So if you look at that blue map, you will see the there's really limited areas where additional development will occur. This is the chair. Thank you, Laura, for that clarification. Um, I will throw it out to the committee. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion?
Um, this is Dana Templeton. I think, and um, I would like to say that um, I did uh, take heed with, um, is it Mike from the Riverfront Snap? I do, uh, I do believe and concur that you are going to continue to do the best you feel is best for the Riverfront Design Review Board and Oklahoma City. So um, I would be willing to make uh, um, a motion to um, provide a recommendation of approval for PUD 01725 on the basis that we change the planning and permitting requirements as shown in 9.17.2 to read, development within this PUD shall not be required to go before the Riverfront Design Committee for approval unless greater than 20,000 square feet um, foot floor plate, all signs, structures, buildings, and building additions less than 20,000 square feet, and parking lots shall be permitted administrative review and shall not be required to be heard by the Riverfront Design Review Committee. New structures shall follow the same architectural style, which has, is prevalent in the Boathouse District. And the next paragraph read, however, any structure or building over 10,000 square feet area with in 10,100 feet from the top of the bank of the Oklahoma River shall be heard by the RDC. Okay. Thank you, Dana. Do we have a second? This is John Joyce. I'll second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? And before we go to a vote, uh, can I ask if there were any citizens to be heard? And if if not, we'll proceed. Are there any other discussions? And this and this is Laura from the planning department. Just to clarify for anybody that might have called in and we didn't know they were going to call in, if you're wanting to speak, you need to do. Star six and identify yourself. So I think we're good. I don't think anybody. Okay. All right, very good. Well, let's. Um, Mark, would you please have, do a roll? This is this is Barbara <coughs> Larson. I have one further question. I apologize. Um, um, I am looking at nine dot ten dot two on the attached fines. Can you clarify that the intent here is that a sign attached to a building can be EMD level one, two, or three? So this is Tim Johnson. That is correct. And that would be a permanent attached sign to a building. That's correct. Any further discussion? All right. Mark, would you proceed with the roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. I show that the motion was made by Templeton, seconded by Joyce. Uh, Scott Howard? Yes. John Postick? Yes. Michelle Dean? Yes. Brian Doherty? Yes. Jonathan Heisel? Yes. John Joyce? Yes. Barbara Larson? Yes. Dana Templeton? Yes. Gloria Torres? Yes. All right, I show nine ayes, zero nays. Okay, motion is approved. Uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for your great efforts out there, and thank you, Tim, for uh, walking us through this. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Okay. We'll continue to uh, item eight, communications. Any communications, Laura? Uh, if you have questions, if you guys have any questions about any of those, I can, by all means, it, they're two small cell polls. Okay. Uh, item 8B, comments from planning department staff. I want to thank you all. This is Laura Griggs, planning department. I want to thank you all for participating in this and your patience. Um, and we do have items 
for next month's meeting, and uh, we will be preparing them for another teleconference meeting probably. So if anybody has any questions, comments, suggestions about how today might have gone better for you, please, by all means, let us know. And um, welcome to the new members. And we will get your notebooks to you um, as quickly as we can. So that is all I have. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Item mm -hmm. 8C, comments from committee members. Uh, as chair, I, again, would like to welcome Gloria and welcome back Brian. So thanks for being on the committee. Uh, we talked. Go ahead. This is Gloria. I just wanted to say um, I actually am learning quite a bit. I am excited to be a part of this uh, committee. And I think the meeting went extremely smoothly. So I don't know that I would suggest anything to make it a better experience. Thank you all, especially the staff. Thank you. Well, I know Laura put in a lot of work on this, so thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Item D, we've already talked about the next meeting date, which, which will be May 7th, 2020. And with that, uh, unless there's anything else, uh, we'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all.